right, good evening to everyone physically here or electronically here. Good to see you or uh, to be seen. Tonight, if you would, take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, we're going to be looking at the first four verses of this chapter. Relationships. There are different kinds of relationships. Uh, we have family relationships, whether it's a spouse or children or parents or siblings. And then there's the whole extended family, right? You got grandparents and cousins and aunts, uncles, the whole gambit of relationships there. Maybe it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, perhaps a fiance. There are those family-type relationships. And then we also have friendships, right? Some that are close friends, some that are more like acquaintances. And then we also have some work relationships. You have your colleagues, you have your boss. Um, you have those people you interact with at work. So there are all sorts of relationships. Lest we not forget one that is very important is the relationship we have with each other at church right so there are different kinds of relationships that we have and to be honest relationships are hard normally they are hard the closer you become with someone normally they are hard or they come into more difficulties or uh, you realize more things about the other person and it puts a strain on the relationship. So tonight I want us to look into the relationships and how we interact with each other in order to give God the glory, in order to uh, be faithful in correct relationships. You know, God is about reconciliation obviously he is as he came to reconcile us back to himself who had severed the relationship that he had made back in the garden so he is all about restoring and reconciling and bringing back into close fellowship people he also wants us as believers to do the same job and bring people together with people so let's go here in Luke 17 we're gonna begin in the first verse here it says then he said unto the disciples it is impossible uh, I'm sorry it is impossible but that offenses will come but woe unto him through whom they come it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. I want us to look at two thoughts, two ideas tonight. The first is how we are to act, right? In a relationship, you got two sides, right? In, in, let's think of a relationship at church, right? There's you on one side and somebody else on the other side, right? Just like in a marriage, there's the husband, there's the wife, there's two sides. And you know what? Everybody has a part. Some people will say there's his side, her side, and the truth, right? Everybody has their own viewpoint, and they don't always take in the full story. But here, God is laying out how each party is to live. So the first step is, how are we to act? How are we to behave? What are we to do? It is to watch out so that we do not live in a way that offends someone else so that we don't live in a way which is a stumbling block right 
an offense, a scandal, something that would cause someone else to stumble, to fall. God says, hey, you are to live in a way that you do not cause someone else to stumble. You don't want to cause an unbeliever to stumble in such a way that that unbeliever refuses to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. Now, obviously, each person has their choice, and God holds people accountable for their choice in whether they believe or don't believe in Messiah. But He also holds us accountable for the way we live because our actions actually affect other people. Is it not so prevalent in this day and age that people live however they want, thinking that whatever I do, it doesn't really matter. It it brings no consequence to someone else. It's all about me. They don't care what it does to someone else. But actions actually affect other people. And sometimes our actions are an offense to others to where they would refuse to believe, refuse to accept, refuse to believe uh, or even read the Bible or go to a church, you would talk to people and they say, oh, you're one of those people who believe in Jesus. Oh, I had an experience with one of them. They live just like me, so I'm never going to believe in that. And God says, in your relationships, in your interactions with other people, you need to make sure you do not offend. There's offending Christians. Upsetting someone, perhaps... Someone who's a young believer. Maybe it's someone who is an immature believer. And you would live in such a way that it would cause that person to turn from God and and, and not care so much for God. Live however they please or not be dedicated and not serve, not get involved because of the way that we had acted toward them. And God says, look, it would be better for someone that they would have a huge stone wrapped around them and then thrown in the sea than for them to cause somebody else to stumble and fall. So my actions, the way I am to act, the way I am to speak, the way I am to live is to be so that I do not cause another person to stumble into sin. Now, that's hard, right? Now, if if you live, right, you realize how sinful you are and how often you do things that hurt other people. And it could be really quick, right? You've had a rough day. It's finally calmed down, you know. This is a personal example. Kids are finally tucked in bed, right? Summertime, it's getting even later they're going to bed. They finally go to bed. And you sit down and you're exhausted from the long day. And what happens? You hear the bedroom door creak open. And then you hear those little footsteps beginning to come down the steps. And then you hear the words, Daddy... Go to bed! I told you to go to bed! You've been out of your bed 12 times. So quick, so easy to react in a way that is so sinful. I don't want to offend my children to turn against God, turn away from God because of the way that I lived. And we laugh because, you know, we've been in those situations. And it's it's so true. It's so real. And in and, and one perspective, it's like it's such a small situation. But how big of an impact that one small action or reaction can have on someone else. And it affects people in different ways, right? Maybe it's just... Somebody trips on the sidewalk, and we begin to laugh at them. You know, it's funny, it's humorous. They kind of fell over the thing that was right there in front of them. And we chuckle, but some people could take that to heart and get offended. 
Sometimes it's the way we react in our sin and, and someone says something. We don't like what they said and we're going to prove to them that they're wrong. So we speak words right back to them in an angry way. Whether we're right or not, whether that person truly was wrong or not, we're coming across so angry, so arrogant, as if this is the right, I am right. It's not about correcting their wrong. It's about proving to them I'm right. And it easily and quickly offends the other person. And God says, do not offend. Take care that you do not offend and cause someone else to stumble. That's one aspect of how I'm supposed to act toward other people. That's one aspect of how I'm supposed to live with my brothers and sisters in my church. Satan longs to divide us. If he can get me mad at someone else, if he can get someone else mad at me, and that issue is not resolved, it then begins to fester and spread throughout the whole church so that discord is sown, so that there's not unity, so that there's some anger, there's some slander going around, there's some gossip, there's some backbiting. And then it just destroys the church. He doesn't have to work hard if we do the work for him. How much he loves all that's going on in our world today where people are just so, uh, you know, a, a fighting and, and, and against each other and hateful toward one another and speaking evil to one another. He loves it. And we feed the fire when we act like that. So as a body of believers... We are to act in a way so that we don't cause each other to stumble in sin. So that we don't push one another to do something that's wrong or to turn against God or to, to get mad at each other and to get mad at God. Our actions, our, we are responsible for our actions and they are to be ones that are not to be laying stumbling blocks. And let me tell you, we cannot do that on our own. I can't do it. I told you, even personal example of me wanting to relax after my kids go to bed. I cannot be patient. I cannot be loving. It requires us to depend upon God completely. We must submit to Him. And let Him work through us because He can love. He can be patient. He can be kind. He can give us the wisdom and how to respond to someone else. The words to say. How to defuse an angry situation. We've got to depend upon Him. And it's got to be moment by moment so that we don't cause our brothers and sisters to be offended and to sin. So that's one part of how we're to act. Then it comes down in verse 3. Right? Right? Chapter 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. Be careful. Be aware. Put an exclamation point there at that one, right? If your brother trespass, if he, he actually sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in one day and seven times in a day, turn back to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. What is my response to the way others act? Right? What's my response supposed to be after reading this? When we're offended, when someone sins, when we're aware and it's made known to us and it's really offended us, we are to go to that person Confront that person, rebuke them in the sins, and tell them 
this is what you've done to me. This is how you've wronged me. Now, we have to be very careful because our tendency is to rebuke in the wrong way, right? Oh, let me tell you the wrong that you did to me. Oh, that's sin. Let me just point it out, right? We can be really quick to point out other people's sin. But this rebuke is not that sinful rebuke. This is the rebuke out of love. It's the loving rebuke just like God has to us. You know when he comes to us reading his word and his spirit convicts us and says, hey, that's sin and you need to get that right. God isn't arrogant coming in a way of being like, oh, you need to get that right, you know, as we often are so quick to point out everyone else's sins. Almost as if God's gifted me to this church to walk around and point out everything that they do wrong. Take the big log out of your your eye, right? So you can see clearly to help that person who has that splinter in his eye. We're to lovingly go to that person. Look, it's supposed to be motivated by love. You realize that is sin in that person's life. It's destroying them and it's destroying other people. And you want to help them. It's not about helping yourself. It's about helping them. You know, you raise kids, and uh, oftentimes when there's troubles or they do something wrong, right, you can, you can react different ways. One way would be, I'm just not going to worry about it. Another way is to get angry and be like, hey, that's wrong, and get mad and fight them. And that's not right either. The correct response is come to them and say, hey, I love you enough. I realize that, hey, even though you're two, if this heart, if this attitude continues, you're going to be in a world of trouble as you're an adult. I love my two-year-old kid enough, I'm going to correct that. Because you can't get your way. You see adults and they, they live in a way that, hey, I'm, I'm, I, I can do whatever I want, I'm always going to get my way, and then they pout when they don't get their way. It's got to be corrected. And we often do that as adults, right? When we're interacting with adults in the church. You know, we have... Two, two wrong spectrums a lot of times in our reaction to sin. It's either, well, I'm just going to not address it, just pretend like it didn't happen, you know, let the sin be there. I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to be kind, not, not make any trouble, I'm just going to let it go and, and let it just fester. And that person continues living in sin. That is destroying the other person. The relationship isn't restored. You and the other person are are not still restored back together in fellowship. It's been cut off and you're not addressing the situation. Other times our reaction is to fight back. Oh, you sin against me? Well, I'm going to sin against you. We're going to get this straightened out. And that's the two different extremes. But God is wanting us to come together, see the problem, handle the problem, and be restored and reconciled. And so he says, you go to your brother and you rebuke him. And what is that person's response? Hopefully is, hey, I sinned against you. You know, you're right. What I did was wrong. Will you forgive me? What is our response? We go to that brother, we rebuke them, and we say, Hey, this is sin. And he says, will you forgive me? He says, look, I'm really glad you know it's sin. But no. No. What is that? The brother finally realizes he sinned 
and he's confessing? Yeah, I forgive you. What you did was wrong. It is sin. Yeah, I forgive you. Well, how many times do I have to forgive that brother? Because, you know, if he does it, a lot of sins. Like, is there a limit? And he makes it clear. If that brother sins against you seven times in a day, you forgive that brother seven times in a day. Seven times. All the times you forgive him. Each time. You know, as we spend more time with people, we see that ugliness and that sinfulness. And we have to forgive a lot. You probably have to forgive those that you spend more time with more than you have to forgive other people, right? The more time people spend with me, the more they're going to have to forgive me. The more they realize how sinful I am. I say things I shouldn't say. I do a lot of things I shouldn't do. And people are going to have to forgive me over and over again. Isn't it great when we sin, we go straight to God and he forgives us? We talked about this a few weeks ago in the book of Joel where we're to seek God and he's ready to forgive. He is ready to forgive. Like you never have to go to God and say, God, I'm confessing this sin. I'm hoping you're going to forgive me this time. He forgives it right away. How could we then treat each other in a way where we're not going to forgive? We're going to hold anger and bitterness and say, what you did to me was so wrong. When we ourselves are so full of sin. We a sinner who do a whole bunch of bad things not forgive another sinner who does a whole bunch of bad things just like us. But yet God, who is perfect, who has never sinned against any of us, says, both of you come to me and I'll forgive you of everything. Our forgiveness is linked to the whole fact of how much he forgave us. That's how we're to react. And just to make sure we've kept the the line of thinking here, so the way we act is to not cause offense. And the way we respond to others and the way they act is to lovingly rebuke them and forgive them. But we need to go back to how we act. Because, yeah, we're not to offend, but there are times when we do. So our response in humility needs to be, I need forgiveness. Right? So we're, we're looking at that passage and we might think, oh yeah, the other person needs to come get forgiveness. And we don't twist it around and put us as the other person. I did the offending. I need forgiveness. Sometimes we don't need another person to come rebuke us. Hey, what you did was sin. Sometimes we know right after we do it. Right? Kids walk down the steps. I yelled at them. I know right then and there, that was not right. Not right. Like, I don't need someone to, you know, hey, you getting mad and angry at your kid was not okay. I, I'm, I'm aware already that that's not okay. So what do I have to do? I have to go upstairs and I have to say, hey, I am sorry that I did that. I should not be impatient. I should not have... I was unloving. I was unkind. Will you forgive me? Thankfully, my kids are so so great at that forgiveness thing already. It's great. They have to forgive me a lot. But that's our reaction with our brothers and sisters in church. Hey, I shouldn't have talked to you that way. Hey, I'm really sorry for the way I acted toward you. I'm sorry that I didn't think about you. I'm sorry that I didn't speak to you. Will you forgive me? And that relationship is restored. It's all about how we act and then how we respond to the way others act. So that there is unity in our body. There's going to be sin. You got a whole bunch of sinners? There's going to be sin. But God giving us a perfect example of reconciling us to himself, wants us to be reconciled to each other and to live as a unified body in his spirit.
Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this truth in your word. May we live loving you, living for you in such a way where we are careful in our actions, where we're dependent upon you to lead us in the words to say, lead us in the way to live so that we do not offend. And when we do, that we would go to one another in humility, ask for your cleansing, and ask for the other person's uh, forgiveness. Lord, may we be a body here at Bethel that is so united around you and loving you. In Jesus' name, amen. I remember a song that uh, we sang in Sunday school when I was a little boy. Be careful, little tongue, what you say. And uh, that's a good one. That's something that uh, we adults need to keep in mind as well. And you know, being able to forgive as well as, uh, well, the Bible says the tongue, you know, we all offend with it. That's, that's life. But uh, also being willing to forgive when someone has offended us is uh, that's a that's a God thing it really is I think one of the greatest evidences of a godly life is the ability to forgive any offense uh, that uh, someone asks you to forgive them of well let's